Welcome to Natural Recovery from Suffering. This is my podcast. This is Scott Killoughby. So I'm just in a rare mood. I mean, it was the middle of the day, and I'm like, I have to just go do a podcast because there's something coming up here. And I want you guys to hear me. Look, I'm just trying to shoot straight with you based on what I've seen. You know, so many years as a teacher, I remember the kind of teacher that I was is I worked one-on-one with people. A lot of that, actually. And I learned so much about how people still struggle even after being exposed to Eastern practices, non-duality, meditation, mindfulness. And yes, there are great benefits. It's unmistakable. I mean, it's scientifically proven that there are benefits to these things. It's indisputable. In fact, right now, we're going through kind of a wave. It started, I remember after we had our, we were the first mindfulness treatment center in the country, purely mindfulness, awareness-based, the Killaby Center and our other center. But it was only then that mindfulness started to become really popular, like in Time Magazine and You could just see in the culture things were changing. It was about that time that I was really starting to understand the limitations of awareness and mindfulness. Um, I mean, I often touted the benefits at our treatment center because there are great benefits, but when you start treating people with addiction and really serious mental health issues, you realize that like simple mindfulness or present moment awareness is not nearly enough to get to the root of those issues. So I think it's a good start, you know, the awareness pointings and all of this. And we can have some deep deep states of realization in present moment awareness. Make no mistake about it, I did. But there's a fundamental missing piece in it all, which is if we don't get to the root of the suffering, the suffering continues, period. And you can trust that in your own experience. We never want to like make how, how do you know when you're really free into a carrot that you keep chasing? But if we don't have some gauge to determine, am I just bypassing? Am I just regulating my system? Am I just trying to feel better all the time? And missing the root of suffering. If we don't have a way to talk about what freedom looks like, I don't know. It feels like there's just no, I needed guidance because I got stuck along the way in a whole bunch of different places, mainly because I had anger and other repression like you all. And when you have repression, it's about staying safe and getting love and that's it. But all that's unconscious. So that creates suffering because we're holding emotions back, right? And then we're forced to identify with what's false, hold anger back, be good get triggered when somebody sees you as bad. That's how that works. If you've done the work, you can see that, that our identities and suffering come from emotional repression. It's like our intentions are good when we come to the awakening path or the, or the healing path. We want to be free. We want to heal. We want to awaken. But through the years, I just noticed how many people really didn't embody that kind of freedom or heal, so to speak. I mean, the numbers are in every tradition of people that I met. It's like people were looking. There were some finders in the crowd, too. You know, people who had shifts like me and teachers that I met. But the question of how do you know when you're really free always eluded me. Because when you don't know what real embodied freedom is, how could you even know that you don't really have it? <laughs> how else do I say that? You can't see what you can't see. You can't know what you can't know. You can't feel or experience what you can't experience. So if you have a certain degree of freedom or presence and you don't want to spend your life seeking, then you might just settle, you know? I think that's what a lot of us do. We don't want to seek intensely for to feel better or to go deeper or whatever because we've spent a lifetime of seeking. So if we get a little bit of peace or, you know, we hit a plateau with a degree of presence and freedom, it's like, 
I'm good for the most part, you know? I'm good. Some of us. And then some of us who experience that go on to be teachers and coaches and such. But what does it mean to actually end the suffering? It's the only thing I'm interested in now. Because I tried everything else. I tried all the bypassing and the landing on the various plateaus and saying I'm done. And then, you know, <laughs> so the question is, I'm just tired of talking about anything other than gets to the root of suffering, what gets to the root of suffering at this point. So if you're not interested in that, tune me out, right? Block me. Don't listen to me on the airwaves because I am not just going to point to awareness or talk about be here now. We're going to talk about the end of suffering, but not as a carrot that you seek, but as a process that undoes you. You're who you think you are and, and what you've built your entire life around, actually. This is an awakening process. So it, your whole world is going to be turned inside out, upside down here in the best way that you can imagine when you go deep here. But there are just so many places that people land along the way. Not only in this work, but in the spiritual path itself. I, I did. And there's just no reason to get upset about that or have any energy. And if you have energy around it, just process it because it's just how it is. <clears throat> and I don't know if we can look to one person and say, that person has the freedom that represents what freedom really looks like. I really do think it's a very personal internal process about how deep we are willing to go into the unconscious to actually end the suffering. And it's not a horizontal game to me. to me. To me, this is not at all a game of seeking in time. In fact, it has nothing to do with that. The seeking in time is just one of the programs within the conditioning of the trauma. Get away from the, from the buried stuff in the body now. Go seek enlightenment or something in the future. or healing, or whatever. See, I just don't think we can let this, I don't want to seek, or I'm tired of seeking thing, be the way that we just stay safe. I used to be kind of anti-seeking too. Even kind of as a teacher, trying to help people end the seeking, because the dreadful seeking is such the suffering, but frankly, the seeking is just a result of the suffering, in my view. Why would we be seeking enlightenment if we weren't already suffering? And so putting the seeking for enlightenment to rest sort of like says, that's like people who have trauma who become addicted to alcohol and who just put the alcohol down. They don't get to the source of the pain, the reason that they're addicted. It's kind of like that. I just, I, I don't know how to sum this up other than to say our nervous system seeks safety and love and approval. So if we can just find a place along the way that's not really the embodied freedom and just hang out there, we will and get love and approval there also. <laughs> not just stay safe from what we've buried still, right? what's still buried, but literally live from that and continue to stay safe and get, or get love and approval from each other. And I guess that would be okay, except that is our suffering. That's it, because we're being what we're not by holding back those parts of ourself. The seeking isn't the problem. Don't get confused on the path. The seeking comes because of the suffering or with the suffering, right? It's only natural, actually, that we seek when we're suffering. But the question is, what do you do with the seeking? If you just make it your 
sole purpose is to put that seeking to rest so you can quote unquote live in the moment, then you might live in the moment with repression in your body. Wait, and then no more seeking or not much, but then you've got some other suffering, like it turns to chronic pain or whatever. Include it all because repression drives a lot of suffering, according to science. You don't want to just put the seeking to rest. I think you, you want to get to the root of suffering. But if you don't know how, you might settle for putting the seeking to rest and then just hanging out in the now in a kind of a head awakening because it's the trauma and repression in the body that are keeping the score. So the head awakening won't end the suffering. It might end some of it. Whatever you're holding in your body isn't finished with you yet. I thought I could get around it too, but you can't because the body does keep the score. So the work that we're doing here focuses on the body and the unconscious programs there from the beginning and includes the recognition of presence. But it's the making the unconscious conscious in the body that brings the freedom, frankly. I mean, it's both together, actually. I'm just saying that if you don't embody presence, it's actually, there's so many places that we can just kind of land. And we have that right to, you know, we just have the right to suffer. Or even if we realize or we have some state, we have the right to think we're done suffering even if we're not. We have the right to fool ourselves, actually. We have, we have the right, in my view, to do all of that. The reason I say that is because I don't want to suffer. I don't want to suffer if somebody else is suffering. They can suffer. But if you're interested in ending suffering, then I just want you to tune in to me going forward because that's what I'm focused on. And nothing short of that. And it is not a time game. It has nothing to do with seeking in time. That's just what the conditioning creates. We create that seeking time story, person story, to stay safe from what we've buried, to keep the sense of separation alive, to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves from each other emotionally, to hold ourselves back with each other, and to identify with false stuff with each other and suffer. So you see, once you really, really see that the root of suffering has to be dealt with, if you want to end suffering, then you just want to get to it as soon as you can, right? You don't want to wait because waiting to get to the root of suffering prolongs the path, prolongs the suffering, you should say, right? Because the root of suffering, if we don't get to it, it's going to drive suffering. It's going to create more seeking, more pain, contraction, persistent conditions, chronic things, diseases, depression that doesn't lift, anxiety that's always there, relational problems that keep happening. Repression is active and ongoing. It's our trauma. See, how I came into this was safe because I set the goal too low I was like, I want to wake up to awareness, just like everybody else, as if that's going to end all my suffering. That was the safety mechanism in me that said, well, I don't want to go down and feel the buried stuff. There was nothing in me that wanted to do that. But there was something in me that wanted to wake up. And you know what? I think it was actually just the ego that likes to wake up first before the embodiment because it's safe. You don't have to feel what's buried and you can get love and approval from other people. I mean, what better way than if you're awake or if you're even if you're a teacher, <laughs> sad but true, you know. And I don't. I think if we don't just start speaking honestly, and you can't do that when you have repression and shame, then we're not really gonna. A lot of us be free, really free. Because I can see the hiding game. The awakening thing draws people in who already have repression. It's like a shelter. You don't have to feel your stuff, yet you can be free. No, I mean your buried stuff. 
See the promise of safety inherent in it, hidden in it. Because the real freedom is involves more than you're the awareness. Because your system will fight that tooth and nail because it thinks it's a death to recognize that. And it'll produce more suffering until that's embodied. Even if the suffering thins out. But frankly, mine didn't. A lot of emotional suffering got put to rest when I shifted to presence and then I got two diseases. I don't know. Suffering is suffering. Stay tuned. I have more. I've seen so much suffering even after people have been exposed to the practices and teachings all over the world that I just want to speak straight. At least from my perspective, I don't think I'm speaking absolute truth. So if you read that into me, that just might be a way that you're staying safe, that you don't hear it. You just like attribute it to some ego thing. But hear this, if you will. When I look at the spiritual scene, a lot of it is there, there's trauma bonding. There are teachers just like me who are getting love and approval from pointing a certain way that regulates people's nervous system, mainly. Not a lot of people are really, really waking up and very, very few are embodying that. There's a lot of trauma. And it's not being recognized because it's hidden in the bodies of both the teachers and the coaches and therapists and seekers and people, all of us. And it was hidden in me too. And if we continue to do only certain practices and pointers, it'll remain hidden in us. And I'm afraid that we're going to continue to get sick even after we have these states or shifts. And some of us are going to die from the diseases that come from not getting to the root of suffering. It's already happened throughout history. We just haven't been recording it and paying attention to it and studying it. We're starting to. Much more. Even Ken Wilber's doing work in this area to track the bypass and how it affects people who sit in meditation or as awareness and don't deal with their shadows and their repression and get sick or continue to suffer in some way. It's no longer time for quietness around the subject for me. It never was, but I mean, I was being still a little bit polite by not speaking really directly to this. But you know, what I've real realized about love is that even if you say something that hurts somebody's feelings, if it's honest and true, and if it comes from the right place, it's, it's good. Because when you do the repression work, you're not looking for people's approval anyway, or for people to think that I'm good or anything. I'm just here to convey a message. We're human beings on an earth, and we've been suffering, and desperately looking for the answer to truly end the suffering, and very few of us have found it, and Dan and I have found it, we want to talk about it, and we want to talk about it loudly, even if it pisses people off, because I think you would want to know about it too. And if you found the end of suffering or how to get to that your own way, then you should be loud about it. But nobody should be quieting anybody who has a path to the end of suffering unless they're afraid of that. Nobody's quieting us. Everybody's listening. The people that are listening here are listening. What I mean is repression quiets this message. This is what we've learned. Dan and I have learned that when you start talking about the root of suffering, you know, specifically emotional repression, our systems do not like that. And because we're seeking safety and love and approval, may not want to go towards that message at all. And seeking safety, yeah. But it has to be talked about. I think if we're going to end suffering, if we're going to pay attention to the science that says that emotional repression is driving a lot of suffering, how the hell are we going to end suffering without dealing with it? <coughs> we can't turn away from it and act like it's not here. We can't develop or believe in a spiritual language or an awareness language and then just sit here and tell ourselves that that's just con those are just concepts or those are only egos that deal with that. Because when we say that, the repression in our bodies right in that moment is producing the suffering in our lives and the diseases and pain that's happening now or later. It's not worth it 
to hide this from ourselves when it's the root of suffering. We don't have to do it anymore for those of us who are ready. Not everybody's ready. That's not a judgment, that's a fact. Because the operating system demands that we stay safe and get love. And if we're not aware that it's demanding that, no matter what we're telling ourselves at the surface, if we're not aware that the operating system is demanding that and therefore demanding sabotage and suffering and seeking, how are we going to end those things? If we talk about it in different words, if we point away from it, if we just point to the space or the awareness in which it's happening and not to the mechanism itself that's producing it all. And that is not the stories in your mind. That is not the I thought. It is the I thought, but it's like the I programming buried in the body with the fear of anger and hurt and the shame. There's identification in the body, but it's certainly not a thought. It's not a story. It's more like a mechanism of survival. And so we have to include embodiment because the survival mechanism is in the body, programming. <clears throat> and even as we have these states of realization like I've had in so many teachers and non-teachers, it doesn't matter. See, in the end, if you're still suffering, that's what matters. I spent years in chronic pain. I woke up to awareness. The chronic pain was quieted because awareness was really big for a while. But then because the pain was coming from repression, the pain got worse and worse. It couldn't be ignored. And it couldn't even be allowed because it was so painful. Nerve pain. that be with what is broke down for me completely. Because in being with what is, including not medicating that, I wanted to kill myself. Let's scrap be with what is if it becomes a source of suffering. And it is if that's all we're doing. Because in being with what is and me being with that pain that was so intense, I was ignoring the repression of emotion right under that and didn't know that I was choosing the pain unconsciously. The programming was demanding it and demanding any other suffering that I saw in my life. God, I wish I would have known that from the beginning of the spiritual path. That's what I was sharing with you guys in an earlier podcast. A trillion distractions from the source is that if we could be armed, well, we are in this work. We are. So we've solved the issue. But if we could know from the beginning of an awakening path or an awareness-based practice that our suffering is being created, we are choosing it unconsciously to stay safe from what's buried. The programming is choosing it, demanding it, so that we can get love and approval from others, stay separate, deficient, and survive. That, that there's programming behind it, and it's in the body. And so maybe we're eager to investigate suffering early on the path, but are we in, eager to investigate the root of suffering early on the path? It's safer to just investigate the suffering. The suffering is produced by the repression to keep us safe from the buried emotions. And that way you'll notice that resting and being with what is is actually safe compared to really being with what is. Because what is includes what's been buried. That's creating suffering. We're just not conscious to it. The buried part. Until we are. How do we know if we're conscious to the buried stuff? Well, it's the same thing as how do you know if you're really free? There's no suffering. Suffering ends. 
being and being yourself takes over. Stay tuned. <laughs> I was just saying, come on, dogs. We're done suffering. Come on. Come into the room. We're, do we're all done suffering now. I think they were already done suffering before that. I'm pretty sure. Because <clears throat> they're just being and being themselves for the most part. So from, from the beginning of this path, we use this 3D repression inquiry to target the programming that's hidden in the, in the body. You can find it in the contractions or the, your hardened body. It's actually tension and constriction and a sense of separation and deficiency. That, that's the repression. And it creates the suffering. The visible effects of it are things like stories, shadows, narratives, and like science says, disease, chronic pain, depression, anxiety, mental health issues, addiction, and so on and so forth. And once you really know that in your mind, and then you gain the context here that we have that helps you understand that this is the path and practice, and then you have the skills, there you go. <clears throat> then you can discover what it means to be really free. And somewhere along the way, maybe even from the beginning, you're going to set your eyes on a target or think about it in terms of time. Seek the end of it or the results or the benefits. It's all natural. I was saying the best I can, the best thinking of dogs, and I was saying the other day, when my dogs are suffering, they take care of themselves until they're better. They also want to end the suffering to the extent they experience it. Licking their wounds here in the now until the wound isn't there or feeling anxious and going into a little closet by themselves. But it's the seeking energy that's, the, that's really the only thing that stands in the way of people really embodying true freedom. Is It's not just that the seeking is there, but when people put it to rest, they often think they're done. So first we're seeking something, and then we might have a shift or a state or a realization. And because the seeking for that is done because we've recognized the awareness in which the suffering is happening, maybe less suffering because of that shift, but still suffering, we might think, okay, that's it. We have every right to think that's it, actually. But if we understand from the beginning of this path that we're driven on seeking safety and getting love, then we can pretty much bet that that's still there. If we check into our bodies, we'll find it. That is, as we shift... And we notice that there's suffering still there in some way, go into the body, you'll find the repression. Because the inside and out are one. And the unconscious programming in the body corresponds to suffering on the outside in our lives. And you can trust that. You know, you can trust it once you're skillful. Before you're skillful, you can't, you're not conscious of the programming in the body. So the suffering just looks like it's happening to you. Not that you're creating it. It really looks like it's separate from you. Hence the sense of separation. The shadows, the triggers, create a sense that people are separate from you and there are emotions and contraction with it in the body that makes it really feel true. When you're depressed, you feel separate from other people. That's the repression creating that sense of isolation. I mean, we're very self-protective beings, emotionally. And we have a lot of ailments and conditions and disorders that have been named because we haven't named the culprit directly until science has recently. The core of it is the holding back of these emotions, the fear that we carry in our bodies of just being ourselves. And so we, can't, we don't think we can be ourselves and survive. We've, we learn that we can't. In childhood, you can't feel and express everything. So we're forced to identify with this false 
these false identities. And the seeking comes from that too. Because if you feel lacking and deficient and separate because of this trauma and repression in your body driving you in that way, then it's just natural, like my dogs, to want to end that. But if you find yourself thinking and preoccupied with it, see, that's how we stay safe. It's just by, let's think about it in the future. How long will this take? When will I be done? Will this go on forever? <laughs> and that's a perfect way to just stay out of the body. That's what your system is creating that. But if you don't have the right context and skill to meet it, you'll just stay safe with spirituality, as I said. You'll, you'll just try to inquire into the seeking and not see that it has this connection to the fear of being yourself, the programming of that in your body. And it drives that seeking to find yourself, so to speak. We call it oneness, but we have to be careful to, that we depersonalize it so much as if we're trying to escape the human aspects, right? We have to really be careful, I think, in, in, in how we language awakening and enlightenment at the conscious level because we're trying to hide the buried emotions from us. It's the trauma driving it all. And so if we don't call it out, we'll be lost in this language that spiritual awareness and stuck in a sort of half-baked realization where we're, we've had a head awakening, but we won't go all the way because we don't even know that there is such a thing when we're unconscious. And once we put the seeking to rest, we might not even be concerned about a deeper recognition. It might think that people who are concerned about that are just seeking and that they're somehow lower or less conscious. And all that's just keeping us safe because there is a deeper freedom. There is a freedom, embodied freedom. It's not a state, a static state. It's not a person who has it. It's the doing of the work that's necessary to put the suffering to rest. And it's not a time game. The time, the mind that says it's a time game, again, is just protecting you from getting to this stuff. And it does a hell of a good job in distracting you into thinking that you're seeking enlightenment or awakening in the future. It's brilliant that it does that to us because there's only this as we know the here and now presence and here in the here and now let's talk about what's here even if you don't know what's here can we just talk in this last segment of what I've discovered that's here as you go into the unconscious and I think as I describe it it'll make sense why we're seeking and suffering so much stay tuned One way to say it is I think a lot of us just sell ourselves short because we're afraid. We may not even know that we're afraid because the emotions that we buried and the fear of that is frozen in our bodies and it just feels like a sense of separation, like physical. And we might just rest as awareness and say that's just a sensation somewhere or that's just chronic pain or that's just, that's just my disease that I got diagnosed with and the sensations that go with it. But that just could be where we're storing the emotions and the fear of those emotions that are now frozen. Go read the trauma research when I, when I say frozen. And it just feels like a... But see, when you wake up then, it doesn't even feel like a body, a separate body. It just feels like sensation. It's so easy to dismiss or disregard or just rest with. Which is kind of dismissing it because it's not just a sensation. An awareness... The forms aren't just here for no reason. They're here because we're choosing them on some level for safety and to get love. And once we understand that, we can take the freedom, get the, get the, the deepest freedom, because we can trust the body. And when we feel something with skill now, re repression level skill, we can meet that sensation, not just in awareness, but then cover what it has to say. So that's what I've done. And I'll just report back to you what I found in my body and then in also in the body bodies of other human beings just like you if you haven't done this work. And here's how I'm going to present it. I'm going to present it, you know, just from presence. What does it mean to be here now? Be here now. See, we all know 
that the real freedom, freedom would include being here now in relationship. And we all know on some level, I think, that being here now would include being able to feel and express everything that is true for us. We might say that. We may not. But would we also say that there would be no way that we could do that with repression? That we could actually be or be here now in relationship or otherwise with everything that arises if some of it is buried and we don't know it because it's buried. So we really have to consider what presence is. And I think we have to look at our lives and the suffering in it, including in relationship, to know whether we're really experiencing freedom or we're just staying safe somehow on some plateau that we've landed on and we've called it freedom maybe, or we're just, you know, maybe we're endlessly seeking to stay safe too. Maybe we haven't landed. But I really want you to think about what we know now, because I can tell you that here's what we've discovered. Right in the here and now, there's conditioning in your body that's saying no, 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 no to anger or hurt. The feeling of it, the expressing of it, or sadness, fear, it's just going on in us. If there's suffering, it's going on in you. It's going on right now. A deep and unconscious fear of being yourself that you call the sense of separation and deficiency. It's what we call it in spirituality. But it's really fear frozen into a hardened body. And that's our state of consciousness as humans until that body, until the awareness is seen throughout that body and that frozen emotion, contraction, pain is transmuted to presence. And why would you do that? Well, you know, unless you want to suffer, you would. So if you can understand that that's what your system is doing, you just don't know it. That's what repression is. All you can see is what's visible. You can't see the repression. You can't feel it other than it's your physical body. The processes are going on below the detectable level of your awareness, even when you're resting as awareness unless you're prompting that up into awareness, bringing the unconscious in to awareness. And that takes skill, because this programming, this is well-oiled machine, <laughs> you know? This programming is deeply buried. It has served a purpose for us, a separation and survival thing. So I just, I think this this goes to like earnestness and what are we doing if we're coming to a healing path or awakening path what fundamentally are we doing are we connecting what we're doing to science first of all or are we just believing a spiritual framework the stuff that i used to write in my books that was disconnected from the fact that the root of suffering is buried and doesn't arise to that awareness i was writing about what are we buying into that protects us from getting to the root of suffering which we are already unconscious to it's that suffering, that unconscious suffering that brought us here, the buried stuff. In what way are we, engaging, are we engaging in practices or listening to pointers or reading books or anything just to avoid that? And in some way to systematically avoid it. Because if we can buy into a belief system or a practice that really hides it from us and makes us think that we're free when we're really just staying safe and feeling better, which isn't sustainable, we're still going to have suffering. So I, that's why I say that suffering is our best indicator of whether we're really free. And, and I say that suffering is, and you're free to disagree, of course. But, I mean, if we're going to use words, we have to talk about what, we're, the, what experience they're referring to. And how I see it is, with a repression, is the ultimate holding on. If you talk about suffering as resisting or grasping, this is where we're grasping the deepest. Look at this fear of being ourselves, which is this self-contraction, a fear of expressing the anger, fear of expressing the hurt and sadness. Very terribly powerful mechanism in the body, actually, with a mind-body connection full of programming that's discoverable with the right skills. All of that is. But if you just rest as awareness, you can't see any of it. Truthfully. You can't. Not really. You just... 
There's just sensation there. And that's the bamboozle because many of us have come to these awareness teachings like mine and sat in awareness and saw a bunch of stuff coming and going and didn't know it was all just safe. Our system produced it. That suffering was safer than what was buried. And if we sat and rested with it and it kind of got quiet, we still didn't get to the root. And many of us didn't know that. And then more suffering came. That's why I say suffering is the best indicator. And if you can see that repression is the great holding on and that it produces the suffering in your life, the visible suffering, then if you have visible suffering in your life, then you can trust that there's still repression in your body. And that's trusting direct experience, actually. It's not only science, connected to science, but it's really trusting your experience and the programming in your own body and how it works. That's the earnestness, see? It just took me a long time. I try to go my own way with my own, just this whole idea that I could just be with what is and be free. And I was just walking around the earth with the head awakening, the awareness recognition and conditioning that said, stay safe, stay safe. Don't show anger, don't. And it, but it just showed up as pain, very quiet, really quiet, chronic pain. Quiet in awareness, but loud and ferocious once I got the tools to bring it up. Loud and ferocious, a powerful mechanism that had been driving suffering my whole life. It had just been unconscious. And that's what you guys will discover here. Right under your depression is a fiery, ferocious programming that's like determined to suffer, that demands it. Staying safe by holding back. It's a rule at the unconscious level. It's not an option, it's a rule, it's survival. And so suffering is a rule until we make that conditioning conscious. You see, we can't fight against it. We can't try to get rid of things because that's just part of the suffering and it doesn't work. And when you try to get rid of things, that are appearing to your awareness. These are things that are already that you already produced. You created that suffering. So does it make any sense to create it unconsciously and then try to get rid of it? It's almost self-abusive. It's a circular loop of suffering. So at the very least, rest as awareness and let it all be. At just the bare minimum. Because that makes more sense, you know? for us to be unconsciously creating the suffering and at least allowing it when it comes into awareness. But I say go deeper. Get to the mechanism that's creating it at the unconscious level from the beginning of your path or as soon as you hear this or else you'll prolong your suffering because the root of suffering is creating it. If you don't get to it, it continues to operate. It doesn't need your consent and it certainly doesn't need your consciousness to do that. It prefers that you're not aware of it, in a way, if you want to personalize it. And I, can't, I just can't speak any more directly yet. If I can find more direct words, I'll come back. At the same time, you know, I just don't want to people please. But I also want to say that this is true for me too. But the only way that I could even say this is to be really free of you not hearing it and many people not hearing it. But at the same time, if there's anything that I can do to help you hear it, and lately I've come across this realization, if you will, before I leave you, it has to do with hope. And hope is a bad word in some non-duality circles, and I think it, it kind of fucks us because sometimes when we're really suffering, it's the only thing we can hear because with a method like this, we can't offer you safety we can't offer your nervous system more safety. We're offering freedom, and that feels unsafe. So we can't, and we also, I can't sit here and say, hey, do you want to just go feel your buried emotions? Won't that be fun? Because your system will say no. So what I have to do is I have to explain to you, or I want to, that there's a reason to have hope, actually. And you're going to let that fall away at some point. If you need it now, 
I'm going to give it to you. And that too is going to fall away. But don't let it fall away before you use it. I didn't realize that everything has value to us. And everything is here for a reason. And we shouldn't dismiss it. I want you to get what you can out of the word hope and then see its emptiness. Because sometimes that's the only thing that brings people to this work. Stay tuned. I remember meeting a teacher, a non-dual teacher, who didn't become my teacher, but I remember him saying, there's no room for hope in non-dual awareness, in present moment awareness, because it's the presence. It's presence. It's hope is future. And that felt very true from that perspective when that's not needed, of course, which is how I live. I don't need the hope. But I needed it when I had chronic pain because I had a lot of repression. And although the presence was here, the pain, see, suffering is, is suffering, as I said. So I couldn't just say, because it was hopeless. I had a future. It was death. I wanted to kill myself. So people who come who are suffering, some of them, they already have a future, it's a hopeless future. And you don't want to replace their hopeless projection with a hopeful one only. You want to show them or let them see for themselves and find their real freedom. When people are suffering, they can't experience that freedom. And I frankly couldn't, wasn't experiencing it when I had that chronic pain. So if you would have said to me, hey, here in this presence, there's this great freedom. I would have said, I, I know there's presence. I have a lot of pain that's my experience it's not so great you know it's not so free when you're in a lot of pain nerve pain that feels like nails on a chalkboard constantly I needed hope and frankly, I had to look beyond the non-dual teachers and I had to go to people who were innovators like John Sarno, Dr. John Sarno and Ken Wilber and, and other leaders, trauma researchers, Peter Levine, Thomas Hubel, people who were thinking outside of that box of, of the awareness framework and were providing hope for people who were still suffering like me even after the awakening here in this this. You know, there's a there's a language game to all this. In other words, if you you can have the awakening, but the language that you buy into that it's all awareness, for example, can shut other languages out and other information out. And I finally looked over to science to get some information that I wasn't getting from my own experience of just awareness and pain, and and got some hope. And then, as I researched it more and found out that repression is really a driver of a lot of suffering, I went into my body and finally, with skill, discovered it. That hope changed my life. The hope that I got from those resources changed everything for me. It's something that presence itself couldn't do because in presence there was just a lot of repression and pain. Sometimes we do need people. We need authority even, if it's the right authority, to help us because we can't help ourselves. So I can't offer you safety. You've been going for that your whole life. That's why you're suffering. That's why you don't hear me pointing to presence only or just offering me only meditation that just provides safety and peace because that doesn't get to the root of suffering. It doesn't bring the deep freedom. I've seen it. Not really. It might look like it, but how would you know what deep freedom is if you have repression and you don't know that? I just didn't know it. That embodied freedom is what I mean. Be here now, including being here now in relationship and being able to feel and express what's true. The true freedom, the flow in life, of in relationship, enthusiasm, joy, that. Not just presence, but the quality of presence which is embodied, which is a certain energetic quality to it. It's alive. It's not living from fear in the same way that you were, when there's just the presence and suffering still, see? So I think it's the ending of suffering that's our indicator. Oh, that
that brings up a whole other thing. <laughs> we have to be honest about what whether we're suffering still. Or we'll keep suffering. Because sometimes we need help. But once I had hope, once I got the help, science, basically, I had hope. That's what that's what did it. See, and then I developed this work and the pain left and freedom. So when I think of all those people, I can't offer safety to you because you've been, again, suffering because of that. I'm going to show you how to say, feel safe enough to investigate what's here for you, what's driving suffering, so that you'll experience freedom and you'll stop living for safety. I understand that you need safety first and that you're going to get that. We're going to show you how to keep it safe when you're inquiring at first. And we're going to learn, teach you how to, to go for the energies where it matters. Go into the body where the real freedom is discovered. And you have to do that for the freedom. It's going to be uncomfortable at times. But that's why it's so deeply freeing. Because you're getting to the root of all that. And you're shortening the path of freedom, the embodiment path, by getting to the root from the beginning. I'm trying to encourage you now and giving you hope that this energy that you've stored in your body that has created suffering, this is your life force. And this work gives it back to you. Or if you never had it, it gives it to you. It, it gives you yourself. You discover yourself. You don't just discover awareness or impersonal awareness. You discover what you are in that. You're an expression of that. Truthfully, those aren't just spiritual words. Those are lived and embodied when you do this work. And, and presence has still the flavor of you, but without the identification and suffering. You don't have to walk around and just pretend to be a, a, an awake zombie like we do when we have repression. You know what I mean? We, have you ever been to those conferences where we're all just looking at each other? That's how it used to be like 15 years ago. Who's the most awake? Who could just stare without blinking? It's just fear because we're still human. You know, we can't just be space. We're not just space. There's a multi-dimensionality to our experience. There's a vibrancy. There's expression, creativity, uniqueness, diversity. Unless we're in repression. And then there's just whatever, right? Most we can hope for is presence. <laughs> it sounds like, it sounds great to some people because you're suffering, right? But it isn't the end of suffering is what I'm saying. Until you embody it. So this work is all about that from the beginning. And if you're interested, if I haven't scared you away tonight, <laughs> if the hope didn't salvage all that, then you can go to killaby.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and take the free repression test. And I always put the link to that test in the description of each podcast episode. Thank you. <laughs>